All right, with an understanding of the single factor model, with an understanding of the most co uh, common or popular single factor model, the capital asset pricing model, and with an understanding of arbitrage pricing theory, what we're ready to do now is talk about multi-factor models. All right, so so it's important to understand where we've been in order to get here. All right. So what we want to do is we want to identify a multi-factor model. We want to include various measures of systematic risk, M1, M2, M3, all the way up to MK. We want to include various measures of systematic risk to make sure that we've accounted for all systematic risk that may exist. All right. And if we can hold constant all of that systematic risk, two things. First, all idiosyncratic risk will be diversified away. Recall this from previous videos. Uh, under the naive assumption of equal weighting, the limit of the idiosyncratic risk of the portfolio can be diversified away in a sufficiently large portfolio as n goes to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero. We've also talked about how the alphas will be arbitraged away, okay? So that the only thing that matters, the only thing that matters here, is the level of systematic risk. Now, how are we going to use this in practice? We're going to try to identify a multi-factor model. We're going to try to account for all levels of systematic risk perfectly, although it's hard to do. And then we're going to try to estimate this thing and try to find alpha. And when we find alpha, we are going to become the arbitrageurs. All right? We're going to buy the stocks with positive alpha. We're going to short the stocks with negative alpha. And we're going to keep doing that until the alphas go to zero until the multi-factor risk model continues to work. Okay, Let me introduce the first one we'll talk about. This is the Chen, Roll, and Ross model. It's been around for a long time. It's, it's, driven by, uh, it's heavily driven by data. Let me explain what this is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the return for a particular stock. Here's a multi-factor risk model in general notation. It's equal to the risk-free rate. Right? There's some intercept there. We get some level of return for zero risk. And then we're going to include a whole bunch of risk factors. Those risk factors are K. And we're going to include the loadings. I'll call these the factor loadings or how an individual asset uh, is exposed to each of these measures of systematic risk. What are we going to use for our measures of systematic risk? Well, in the Chen Roll Ross model of 1986, they use the following. The percent change in industrial production. So think about manufacturing as manufacturing picks up. Uh, uh, there, that, that measures some sort of risk. Look, and if manufacturing declines, that's capturing some sort of risk, right? Uh, mostly industrial production is capturing risk in the employment area. We have percent change in expected inflation, okay? And the percent change in unexpected inflation. So we're going to include these as risk factors. These are certainly risk factors. Why? Because the Federal Reserve is going to respond to different changes in expected and unexpected inflation, which is going to have an effect on the returns of assets. Okay, so we're going to include these two things as as uh, as risk factors, and then we're going to include uh, uh, the risk premium in bonds. This is going to be the risk premium of bonds. Let me explain, and the and the risk premium in the term structure of interest rates. I'll explain both of these last two. So, so this is the excess return, or you can think of this as the excess yield of long-term corporate bonds over long-term government bonds. Which are more risky, corporate bonds or government bonds? Hopefully you said corporate bonds. In that case, the more risky corporate bonds are relative to government bonds, the greater the risk premium exists in the market. That is, the market is now pricing these bonds in such a way that they're yielding higher yields for corporate bonds than for government bonds, suggesting that there is greater risk at the firm level. Okay. Notice there is no subscript here. I said there's no subscript, but there's a subscript number four. But notice there is no subscript for each individual asset I. There's no subscript I for these, ass, or for these risk factors. That means that what I'm doing is I'm taking the yields on long-term corporate bonds over the yields on long-term government bonds. I'm calling that a risk premium, CG. Okay, I'm calling that a risk premium, and I'm going to say that that has an effect on the returns for each asset in the stock market. Okay. Likewise, I'm going to take the yields, the excess return, in long-term government bonds over the over the short-term yield on short-term government bonds. You can think of this as the, the yield curve or the term spread. 
Okay. The term structure of interest rates. This is important. So think about this. As long-term government bonds have yields that are higher than short-term government bonds, that means that the longer duration bonds, there's some sort of risk that's involved there. Likewise, when short-term government bonds, when GB becomes negative, and short-term government bonds have higher yields than long-term government bonds, that suggests that the yield curve is inverted, and that could measure some sort of risk. Okay. And so the Chen, Roll, and Ross model was the following. They basically said that the returns on any asset is going to be equal to the risk-free rate times the exposure of the firm, I, to changes in industrial production, plus the exposure of firm I to changes in expected inflation, plus the exposure of firm I to changes in unexpected inflation, plus the exposure of firm I to changes in what we'll call this risk premium, this bond risk premium, and the changes... Uh, or, or the exposure of firm I in changes of, of the term structure of interest rates. Let me explain a couple of things here. This is in your book uh, somewhere, Bodhi Kane and Marcus. And notice that leading indicators, we have manufacturers' new orders as a leading indicator. Okay, We have industrial production as a coincidental indicator. So certainly there is research that suggests that industrial production, the first risk factor, matters. Okay, Industrial production matters in explaining GDP or economic activity, and that certainly matters for explaining uh, the returns of an asset. Okay. If I look at uh, inflation, what factors here are, are a function of inflation? Certainly money supply, that has an a inflationary component. All right. Personal income has an inflationary component. So you can see how Chen, Roll, and Ross thought that inflation, both expected and unexpected inflation, might capture some of the risk that's associated in the macro economy. Lastly, let me explain the bond uh, risk premium. Look at this. This is interesting. So from 1970 to 2007, sorry I cut off. I just had to grab data as I, as I saw it. As the risk premium increases, that is... On, the, on the, this bottom panel here, the green line represents the risk premium. Okay, As the risk premium increases, so notice that the risk premium is zero here on the x-axis. And there are times when the risk premium begins to increase. What does that mean? That means that government bonds yields, long-term government bond yields, are much lower than, than long-term corporate bond yields. For some reason, there exists a greater level of risk in the corporate sector that's causing bond yields to increase. Notice, look at what happens here. If the green line represents that risk premium in long-term corporate bonds over long-term government bonds, and the orange line represents GDP growth, look, as the risk premium decreases, GDP growth increases, and that's going to have an effect for the returns of assets. Suddenly, as the risk premium increases, notice how GDP uh, growth decreases. And notice that the risk premium is generally happening during recessionary periods. Those are the shaded region, reason, regions. And you can see that in nearly every time where the risk premium spikes, GDP growth decreases, including when the tech bubble popped. And if we saw this during the financial crisis, including then, Right, uh, I think that's important. So you can see why Chen, Roll, and Ross also used the risk premium as a risk factor in trying to explain asset prices or the returns on different assets. Lastly, let's talk about the term structure of interest rates. I've shared this in class before. Okay, This is interesting as well. The, the green line represents the term spread. The term spread is calculated as the following. That's long-term government bond yields over short-term government bond yields. This is actually the 10-2 yield spread. Okay, So the term spread, as the term spread gets larger, that means that the yield curve is getting more upward sloping. I'll refer to previous videos or discussions that we've had in class regarding that. So, so as the term spread gets larger, that means that longer-term yields, longer-term government bond yields are higher than shorter-term government bond yields. The yield curve is upward sloping. However, in the case that the yield curve becomes inverted, the term spread will decrease and even become negative. That's happened several times in the 70s to the 2006. It, it, by the way, it, uh, in 2007, 
the yield curve inverted. By the way, the 2.5 yield curve inverted, uh, inverted last year, which puts us uh, ripe for a recession. Let me explain. So what we do here in the bottom panel, here's the again, the orange line represents the GDP growth rate. What I do is I lag that GDP growth rate one year, or actually uh, I, t I lag the term spread one year. So in other words, does the term spread predict GDP growth next year? And look at that. That's a, a remarkable uh, how correlated those two things are if I, uh, if I take the term spread one year earlier. Okay, so it, it appears that any time, look, any time that that term spread becomes negative, the yield curve inverts, GDP growth becomes negative. We get a recession. Yield curve inverts, GDP growth becomes negative. Yield curve inverts, GDP growth becomes negative. Yield curve almost inverts, becomes very flat. GDP, we have a slight recession. We invert here, we have almost a recession. Uh, later was defined as a recession. Uh, I don't know if there's any greater predictor of recessions than this yield curve and listen the two five spread the two-year government bond and the five-year government bond has been inverted for almost a year and everybody was saying well this is the time where it doesn't lead to a recession and and both goldman and now morgan stanley came out or another bank came out and said that that uh that gdp growth forecasts are going to be negative 30 percent second quarter 2020 so once again, the, the uh, inverted yield curve uh, does a nice job of predicting recessions. What does that mean in the Chen Roll Ross model? You can see why they included some metric that measures inverted yield curves as a risk factor in their multi-factor model. Uh, with all that being said, we're not going to estimate this thing. We, th there's a, a more commonly used model that we're uh, going to talk about next that we're going to estimate. And when we do, what, what are we going to try to do? We're going to subtract the risk-free rate from both sides. When we do, notice what alpha should equal. When I subtract that risk-free rate from both sides, alpha should equal zero. In the case that alpha doesn't equal zero, I want you to arbitrage it until it does.